Presentation up there, presentation on the screens. Awesome. So uh, tonight is uh, just a public information session, not the formal public, just another chance for the public to get a little bit more information, get some updates on uh, where we're going with the zoning bylaw, um, and an opportunity for some questions as well. And uh, I'll try to be brief through the presentation so there's time for questions. I'm not gonna go through the entire zoning bylaw. Um, that would take days. So I'm going to hit high level highlights of, of major changes uh, from the last version. Um, so a bit of an update here on short term rentals. Um, this, this, is, uh, this part here is not an update, but um, a new definition uh, means a dwelling unit or portion thereof uses an accommodation for travelers for no more than 30 days at a time. Uh, Short-term rentals is kind of a generic term for things like Airbnbs, VRBOs, um, this kind of new style of accommodations that's, that's come out in the last five or so years. Uh, there's a lot of sort of ambiguous definitions in the current zoning bylaw. Um, so those have all been uh, removed and replaced with dwelling unit, a short-term rental. And um, this is a chart showing the basically growth of that market uh, since 2017. Um, and you could see it bumping up and up and up each summer, but then this summer it hasn't hit that, that hump again. Uh, I think we all know why. Um, and, and so that kind of change in the market uh, led to a change in the zoning bylaw. So uh, at one point, what we had proposed was a couple of new zones that would be specifically for short-term rentals you would have to go through a rezoning process, most likely if you wanted to have that type of uh, land use. But after discussions with council, uh, feedback from the public, um, we're going with a slightly different approach. So uh, what seems to be happening now is a short-term rental bylaw under the Local Governance Act. Oops. Uh, that's currently being drafted. Uh, and there'll be some references to that in the zoning bylaw. Uh, they would be allowed second uses in state residential, central commercial, and uh, main uses in the tourist commercial zone. And there would be a general provision saying that the operation of a short-term rental shall only be permitted subject to a license or permit issued by the town, and that would come through that short-term rental uh, bylaw. Um, so less dealing with short-term rentals in the zoning bylaw, 
Um, it's actually streamlining what had been proposed. Um, it's merely a question of uh, getting a license under this bylaw and um, abiding by the conditions of that bylaw if you're operating such a development. Um, as well as uh, addressing short-term rentals, another, another change is to increase the residential options in town. So that's one of the reasons why having a little bit of regulation around short-term rentals. Uh, one of the reasons is to um, hopefully uh, with a little bit more work, some people will say, you know, it's just not worth doing. That will open up a few units uh, for long-term use. Um, but as many people have pointed out and as uh, I'm completely in agreement with, um, there also needs to be more housing developed. It's not just about returning some of those short-term units to long-term units. It's also about allowing uh, things like um, garden suites and in-law suites to be more prolific. Um, so accessory dwelling unit, that definition now, if it's, if it's an accessory dwelling unit inside, outside the house, if it's under a certain floor space, um, then uh, it's an allowed secondary use in residential zones. Um, and uh, not exactly the purpose of tonight's meeting, but I do want to mention the secondary municipal plan that we've been talking about. That really deals with look and feel and design of developments in the town plot and historic business district. So um, having uh, that secondary municipal plan along with allowing some new residential uses, you get more apartment rentals, but you make sure that they look and feel like um, something in St. Andrews should look and feel. So as I mentioned, uh, these ADUs would be permitted secondary uses in all residential zones. Um, there's still controls through the uh, number of buildings on a lot. So you're not gonna see you know, six different little apartments on one lot. It would, um, in most zones, it would be, you know, you get one accessory building, something like that. And if you choose to use that for an apartment, uh, like a garden suite, then um, that's fine. As well as the standalone units, um, we've also looked to expand the number of units that can exist inside of a house. So triplexes or three unit dwellings would be allowed in the serviced residential and multiple residential uh, zone. Um, duplexes would be allowed in the ER zone. The ER zone is a little bit more restrictive um, because it's uh, all on septic tanks. Um, so that itself limits the number of units you can get into a house. And again, using that secondary municipal plan to control the look and feel of these new developments so they fit in with the character of St. Andrews. Uh, and part of that as well as limiting outdoor entrances. So um, even if you have three units in a house, um, it looks more or less like one entrance from the front. Uh, we're also introducing a residential growth area south of the Bar Road. Um, those properties, which are uh, the majority are owned by the town, they would be sort of preserved for actual high density um, residential dwellings, uh, something similar to the MR2 zone. Could be townhouses, could be um, basically anything allowed in the MR2 zone. Uh, so that's, that's some work that the town can do to increase their own housing, whether they develop that themselves or in partnership. Another change uh, is the setback from the ordinary high water mark. Um, and uh, that basically is usually where high tide is. Um, so currently uh, in the existing zoning bylaw, there is a complete prohibition on any development within 20 meters of that high water mark. The new policy uh, it does go a little bit further to 30 meters as is consistent with best practices, but it does remove some prohibitions on what you can do and it sets standards. So it, it allows for a reasonable development um, while still protecting the shoreline and aesthetics. So some private residential properties that are green space on the current zoning bylaw, um, they would just, whatever the zoning is, would go all the way down to the water. So if it's a state residential, that would because um, this would be a general provision uh, so it doesn't actually need to be mapped but um, it's taken some pieces from the coastal area protection policy uh, the St. Croix um, corridor regulation which goes right to the edge of town these are all sort of coastal protection um, mechanisms so it, it borrows from those and it can allow for low impact reasonable development that isn't negatively impacting the environment or aesthetics um, so some highlights from that, and you can obviously look at the zoning bylaw for all the details. 
Um, but habitable buildings over 600 square feet, so anything you're getting a building permit for as opposed to a development permit, um, those would require uh, some kind of environmental plan uh, dealing with erosion and runoff um, that would be uh, sort of approved by a development officer before a development could happen in that 30 meters. So uh, it would also limit tree clearing. Um, and it would uh, make sure that people aren't using septic systems in that 30 meters. So if you're in a state residential property, you can still have a septic system on your property, just not within that 30 meters where the runoff would um, almost certainly be going into the water. Uh, this is, so there was some concern, uh, has this going to affect downtown Water Street? You know, the pattern of development are really different there than they are in the outskirts and the more state residential properties. And uh, I think in particular there is that clause on limiting tree clearing. Um, I don't think this would affect the character of downtown Water Street. Most of those properties are already developed and this isn't saying you have to plant trees, it's just saying um, you can only clear a certain number of trees in a certain time period and it, uh, if you have um, you know, dead trees, trees that pose health and safety issues, then uh, there's, there's no issue with clearing those. So I think um, it's not gonna cause any issues with uh, sort of downtown Water Street, you've got the Maritime Village feel outside. Um, in the outskirts, you've got more of the, the rural kind of residential feel. So chickens. Um, this is uh, very similar to other clauses in NB municipalities, St. George, St. Stephen, um, even cities as big as Toronto are thinking about urban chickens now. So this would allow the keeping of chickens in the SR and ER zones, uh, but there'd be a lot of restrictions on what you can do. So you can't sell the eggs, it's only for personal use. You're only allowed female chickens, no roosters, and uh, roosters are the noisy ones, the ones that crow. It limits the number of chickens per lot to four, which is um, uh, less than a lot of the other municipalities. They must be fenced during the day and cooped at night, so they're not running around crossing the road, that kind of thing. Um, coops must be in the rear yard, 10 meters from rear side lot line, so they're not um, causing issues for neighbors. And any nuisance, odor, mess would trigger enforcement. So basically, if you are uh, being negatively affected by these chickens in some way on your neighbor's property, then um, there's there's uh, all sorts of grounds for enforcement. Um, and just uh, for people to have some idea, um, this, is, this is a map of where chickens would likely be allowed. It would still have to be on a case-by-case -case basis, but based on property sizes, space requirements, uh, really in the ER zone, um, lots of space to have them. In the SR zone, uh, there's, there's only so many properties where you could actually do it. So another uh, new um, area for the zoning bylaw, a little bit, this is not the same as the setback for ordinary high water mark. This is the sea level rise overlay zone. So this isn't dealing with where's the water coming up to now, it's where could the water be coming up in uh, 30 years, uh, in 70 years, um, and what's gonna happen when we have major storm surges. So there's, there's really good science um, using international uh, sea level rise predictions that are um, put in the context of our location done by local scientists. Um, and based on that, you, you get this 4.4 uh, meter elevation. So this would strongly regulate development below that elevation. Um, and you can see here on this map, it actually isn't going to affect the town very much at all. Um, in terms of residential properties, it's really just one or two properties on Patrick Street that would be affected by this. Um, and this isn't uh, outright prohibiting development in, in areas that are, would be in red on this map. It's merely saying you can't have habitable, habitable spaces, critical electric or mechanical equipment elevation in case there's flooding and it could cause massive damage. So as long as everything is above that 4.4 meters, um, development can happen as otherwise allowed in that zone. So some other uh, smaller changes. Um, distinguishing between private and public utility uses. Uh, you know, if Bell is putting up um, some kind of uh, internet um, transmitter or something, uh, that would be considered a public utility use because it's for the public. But if you're putting up your uh, pirate radio tower on your property, that would be addressed a little bit differently. Um, some standards for bicycle parking. 
uh, one space for every 20 cars to at least two, um, but not necessarily applying to residential properties or properties within the historic business district as um, space is a little tight there. Uh, zone standards, so your dimensional standards for the mixed use zone. Um, those would be the same as a service residential in the town plat. That's what those properties essentially are. Uh, and before it was kind of whatever zone you're going with, you have those zone standards. So you could have um, properties requiring the same setbacks as institutional properties in the mixed use zone. And uh, it, it makes a little bit more sense just to say these, these all are in the same area. They should um, have the same standards. As I mentioned, the secondary municipal plan, uh, and if you've been following along uh, over the months, you've heard some, some um, discussions about that as well. A lot of the section nine uh, historic business district town plot requirements in the current zoning bylaw have been moved to that document, but a few have been um, put in, in more appropriate places in this document. Flag signs, um, they uh, are not currently allowed in the existing zoning bylaw, but there's been so many businesses that have been grandfathered in over the years that you still have flag signs everywhere um, in the downtown. And so uh, basically it, it makes sense to allow them, but you know, you get one freestanding sign, sorry, one projecting sign um, that's outside of your business and that flag of freestanding uh, or projecting. So, um, you're still limiting clutter on the streetscape, but you're sort of saying, well, these signs are everywhere. It's kind of ridiculous to say the new business can't have them and all the old businesses um, are grandfathered in. Uh, kind of like the residential growth areas um, on some of the Huntsman property that hasn't really been developed yet. The idea of an institutional growth area for potentially a, a knowledge park or, or um, other developments that would um, aid the, the scientific and research community here and per, perhaps open up some new business opportunities and um, get some new businesses into town. And we've been in discussions with them and they're um, very happy to, to be included in that way. Uh, finally, uh, just a look at the zoning map. This is online on the town's website. Um, this isn't the best way to look at it. And I, I believe there's a copy in the town office as well, which um, I believe is open to the public, although Paul will have to confirm that. So if you do want to get a closer look, head over to the uh, town website or stop by the um, town office. And with that, I'm going to wrap up my presentation and I will stop sharing my screen and turn off my mic. So we'll go back to Paul's. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Uh, through you, Your Worship, do you want to start with the audience here or online? Thank you. My question is part of the speech. I live downtown in the town of Memphis Commercial School. When I brought my house, I wasn't in the commercial school on William Street. So if I have to do something that's my house, I can't go get my house rezoned. That's a good question I have. More than happy to speak with you on that after the meeting. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's an easy process and it's actually part of the zoning, but I can speak to you after the meeting. So what's the cost? Free. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, or Xander can speak to we, it. We've identified a number of properties. I'm not sure if there's one of them. There's one of them. Maybe I'll let it from the town. Yes, sir. Okay. Then uh, yeah, we identified a number of properties that were in the uh, central commercial zone and are residential and residential. And they can be to the next use zone, which allows for all residential uses. Um, and I was going through that process with the people, so it's pretty easy to change. We just change all that. Your Worship, maybe as a best practice when someone from the audience asks a question, that uh, we re repeat it so people that are watching online can hear it as well. So they're just, they're just here. There's no questions right now. Thank you. Uh, through you, Your Worship, we'll go to online then. One second. Joanne, can you hear me? Uh, yep. Yes. 
this. Yeah, hi Joanne, we can hear you. Uh, Council, if you want to put in your headsets, uh, just so you can hear, and for the public, we'll let you know what the question is. Uh, Joanne, go ahead. You have Council, so if you want to unmute yourself. Am I muted or unmuted? You're unmuted. Council, can you hear Joanne? Yes. You have all of Council's attention. Okay. So um, I would like to thank the Council for removing the uh, zoning rezoning requirement, which would have been quite onerous. Um, I definitely see both sides of the short-term rental supply um, aspects. Running a business myself, we have employees that do need some it's a mix of short term it's only a few months that they need in the summer but uh, and then we do this even this summer we were turning away guests for whale watching because there is not enough short term rental as well so i think that that aspect has not really been discussed very much in that we do have and overnight places for tourism uh, for guests to stay regard you know related to tourism um, tourism has grown so much so there is the two sides. Um, one of my concerns is that the municipal plan, the primary municipal plan has already uh, passed the second reading. And I know we're trying to pass everything together. We, we don't know what the short term rental permitting is going to look like at this point. I understand it has not, it wasn't presented today. Uh, my concern is the municipal plan's already passed the second reading, so there's a lot in that in that plan that relates to the bylaw. You know, the, the bylaw directly supports the municipal plan. So that other one has gone so far forward. You know, it's passed the public hearing, but we don't even know what the what the short-term bylaws uh, requirements are going to look like. So it's a bit of an issue for having public comment when we can no longer comment on the primary municipal plan. Um, the primary municipal plan directly states that if it is proposed that if the development of short-term rental units within the town of St. Andrews significantly impacts long-term rental supply, council will act to reduce their impact on long-term rental supply. So in that sense, we have no idea what the short-term rental bylaw is going to look like. Um, and we're past the comment section for the primary municipal plan. I've I feel like any references to long-term rental should be removed from the primary municipal plan um, and perhaps only mention the permitting process. Um, there's people who voluntarily registered for the levy program. They did it very responsibly to pay their 3%. And unfortunately, none of those people were notified um, you have you had their addresses and phone numbers, but they weren't notified when the primary municipal plan was being put forward. Um, I believe now you do have an attempt at the zoning short term rental uh, bylaw permitting process is um, actually made that you will be notifying those people. Um, I wonder if another public information session on this um, new law is going to be made in regard to short-term rental or are you or are you going to jump right to the first reading so that's one of my questions because this is a public information session but no reference to the short-term rental permit process was mentioned in this so i wonder if a second public information session is going to be done um, just on the short-term rental permitting process Um, I've had various emails with Santa Goldman and he has mentioned, um, Ms. Carter, that the week, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we, we would like to answer a couple of your questions to start. Uh, so we'll pass it to, uh, CAO Spear. Well, in regards to the short term rental bylaw, it, it's going to be a separate bylaw outside of the municipal plan process and council hasn't even gotten the first draft of it yet. It's just in staff's hands. So we're gonna work on it, but I'm pretty sure that'll go to the public for consultation after the fact. Uh, right now, they're an independent pass from this um, process we're going through here. Uh, what was the second one, Paul, I guess? Uh, it, will there be a public information session? Well, no, I don't know if there'll be a public information session before first reading mm -hmm. or 
different creatures changes to the bylaw you have to go back and do public consultation but for other bylaws under the local governance act we can make changes up to the third reading without having um, information sessions over and over again so we'll have one at some point i can't guarantee it's before first reading but certainly this council will be dedicated to have uh, community input into it including from those that are directly affected so I don't, I don't disagree with the short-term rental permitting process. I look forward to seeing um, what that you helped um, actually, um, you know, validate the short-term rent in town. So it's a positive step forward. My concern is uh, the town's reference in the municipal plan, how it's um, the continued reference on multiple spots in the municipal plan on the impact on the long-term rental. Um, it, what it does is, as uh, Xander Gopin um, said, the language does give the council the flexibility to cap and limit by zone and do a lottery system and cap the number of short-term rentals. And that language is written into the primary municipal plan. And by that, you know, that we're not even sure how that's going to affect because we haven't even seen the short-term rental bylaw yet. Um, but the way it's written in the municipal plan, it's there's much reference to the long-term rental market, which in my opinion needs to be removed. Um, you know, the only valid way to improve long-term rental is building student dorms and townhouses and this sort of thing. So by penalizing the short-term rental market, that that is maybe not the best step forward, but the way it's written so strongly in the municipal plan and we haven't even seen what bylaws be yet um, it's hard now to change the municipal plan it's that one's gone so far forward so how do we get the municipal plan changed you know when we haven't even seen what the short-term rental bylaws are going to be what's our steps for changing that municipal plan and removing well, the students look at it miss carney number one you can still submit your comments to council and if they think they're valid enough to change it in this they can change them now um but something we heard through the whole process is that a lot of people think the long-term rental and short-term market uh, have to have better control in st andrews specifically with short-term rental so that's why it's built in the municipal plan without specifics but that's why under the um, recommendation of our planners in the zoning bylaw, and they're now looking at a separate bylaw that will be uh, coming down the pike in the next few months. Uh, the, deputy mayor, the deputy mayor would like to comment too, Ms. Carney, before. Yeah, just generally on on uh, first of all, a hearing of objections on the municipal plan, it's a presentation from the zoning bylaw. Uh, although I do appreciate the comments on the municipal plan, the purpose of this is to actually talk about the zoning bylaw. However, uh, the points on the short term rental uh, uh, bylaw around is uh, council has best practice with uh, your first meeting, always doing a hearing of objections. I think we've done it every single class in the past, and this one will be no different. So we can public town hall. It'll be an opportunity for public to attend a meeting or a call and give their input or support for it. Uh, so it's going to go through the exact same process as every other bylaw that this town has faced over the last four years. Um, but I will uh, if we, it, the zoning bylaw does reference the short term uh, bylaw. So I do think that it would be imperative for council to have that on the table. Uh, and begin that process before passing the zoning bylaw. So uh, my understanding is staff has a copy of that. Is that correct? So I assume that over the next month, this is something that town council will be, uh, first of all, talking enough to understand and to add our own uh, input before obviously taking it to first reading and then getting some input from the public. So uh, the short-term rental accommodation bylaw, there'll be plenty of opportunity for rental owners. Also, uh, young people are impacted by it that think that we should be uh, taking a look at the growth that has happened over the last few years. So there'll be plenty of, up, uh, plenty of opportunity to dive into that. But as far as the municipal plan, that isn't the purpose of this meeting today, right, unfortunately. Okay, thank you.
Hold on. Go ahead. Thank you. No, I, I think uh, it, I, my comment is the issue at hand, but more about the process. Um, perhaps if we're going to conduct more meetings like this, where we have people in person and people on Zoom, if we had a big screen and microphones so that the people in the audience could hear the questions and the people on Zoom could hear the uh, questions for the, from the people in the, uh, the room, that might be more effective. Thank you. This is just a quick question. We're going on the next couple. Are election signs usually dealt with at um, the zoning bylaws, Andrew, or just by policy? Yeah. Okay.